Jelly ear, Jew's ear, Judas's ear, wood ear or cloud ear. This is a fungus with many common names. Its botanical name is Auricularia auricula judea. More recent field guides give it the name jelly ear and when picked fresh like the ones here they certainly do have a jelly like te texture especially the young ones. But the name Jew's ear being a virtual translation of the Latin isn't going to go away anytime soon. Judas is supposed to have hung himself from an elder tree, hence Judas ear or Jews ear. Another folk belief relates the supposedly poor food quality of jelly ears to that of certain cuts of meat in Jewish cuisine that apparently aren't so great either. Of course, as with many wild foods, to suggest that they taste crap is more a reflection of one's lack of creativity in the kitchen rather than some inherent lack of potential in the wild food itself. In actual fact, jelly ear fungi have a lot to recommend them, both as food, medicine and even as being useful in works of art. When working with wild foods, especially as they grow in popularity, chefs seem to be working with all sorts of increasingly obscure ingredients. I guess that's good as far as it goes. On the other hand, it can be really useful and far more practical, at least on a more regular basis, to work with wild foods such as jelly ear that are not only extremely common but are also very easy to identify. Another great reason for collecting this fungus is that not only can it can it be eaten both cooked and raw, at least when it's fresh like, like it is here, but you can collect it at any time of the year. I find in practice that if you want to gather a decent amount of the fresh ones like those ones shown here, then kind of December, January and February are really the best months. For storage, they can be frozen raw or cooked or just left spread out on a tea towel for a week or so to completely dry out. Then you can just put them in a bag or jar for later use. If you don't fancy collecting them in the depth of a cold February, as you see James doing here, then summer is also a really good time as well. Interestingly, this is one of the few fungi that will be moist, jelly-like and growing in damp conditions that when there is a prolonged dry spell of weather, it can completely dry out, only to rehydrate and continue to grow when conditions are wetter. So actually, I like to harvest them in summer as well, picked completely dry from the tree or log, although you have to be careful not to shatter them, um, and put them straight in the jar for storage, or you can actually just rehydrate them as you're cooking, for example, um, you know, in a, in a soup or stew. As you can probably see from the shiny, glossy, even glassy appearance of some of the ones shown here, it was a very cold day and some of them are frozen solid. Again, this is one of a few number of fungi that can stand being completely frozen, but they'll carry on growing once thawed out. It's a pretty impressive and potent fungus, I think. Of course, collecting them when frozen isn't such a great idea if you're picking by hand and you want them to keep their intriguing shape as they tend to shatter. If you've a firm bladed knife, you can get around that simply by prising them off where they attach to the wood. On the other hand, like with all foraging, you know, it's all about timing, so just come back when it's not quite so cold. Here are a couple of good tips for you if you're collecting these fungi for the first time. Although jelly ear can be found on other deciduous trees and shrubs, I found them on uh, sycamore, field maple, ash, black mulberry, even buddleia. For the most part, I'd say about 95% of the time, you'll find them growing on living or dead elder. That'll be either on the wood of the upright tree or on branches that are lying around nearby. With branches lying on the ground, it's pretty obvious that it's not part of the growing tree. However, sometimes, especially if you're collecting in the winter, there can be lots of fungi growing on the upright wood of the elder trees that are just out of reach. Especially in the winter, the temptation is to knock down the whole thing, as the elder can really look like it's completely dead. I'd advise not risking that temptation, though, as in many cases, really, you'll find that it is actually alive. I've seen elders that, I'd bet, honestly, I'd bet money on that they were completely dead, only to come back in the spring to see sprouts of healthy new growth coming through. Another tip is to gather fresh succulent ones at first. Um, the reason for that is, like all wild foods, like safe eating requires harvesting items that are in good condition. If it is obvious insect damage or is starting to break down and expose any of the kind of jelly, then really just leave it alone. 
you may decide to leave the smaller ones to grow a bit more. Um, you know, that's not a bad thing to do. On the other hand, you might decide to collect every jelly, jelly air you see um, that's in good condition. In such cases, sure, you can feel guilty and greedy if you like, but do bear in mind that given the right conditions, fungi will grow back in the same place within a month, and sometimes even with two, within two weeks. And, I mean, I've come back to places two, two weeks, three weeks later, and there's even a larger quantity than I picked in the first place. One thing I find interesting about collecting jelly ear from living elder is that although elder is a fantastic food and a medicinal plant, especially in terms of the flower buds, flowers and juicy berries, yet the leaves, wood and bark are reported to be toxic. That's interesting because there's another fantastic edible fungi called chicken of the woods that many of you might know that grows on various trees, including yew. Most parts of yew being toxic, the general advice given is not to eat chicken of the woods that you do find growing on yew. Yet I've not come across anybody advising not to eat jelly ear because it grows on toxic elder. Perhaps the wood and the bark simply isn't that toxic or any toxins, toxins that are present simply don't transfer to the fungi. On the other hand, and this is more to do with the inherent properties of the fungus itself rather than the elder. Although showing some medicinal use in terms of lowering cholesterol and in terms of its antibacterial properties, in his excellent book, The Fungal Pharmacy, Ro Ro Robert Rogers, in discussing the fungus's blood thinning properties, suggests that women may observe a heavier menstrual bleed after a meal of these mushrooms. He also says that extracts have been shown to prevent egg implantation in animals, uh, resulting in termination um, of pregnancies um, early mid and mid pregnancy. This kind of suggests that they should be avoided by pregnant women, also those wishing to conceive or anybody who is already taking blood thinning medication. Also, these blood thinning effects can last for several days. So that was a brief introduction into jelly ear, but what about them in terms of their use for the forage book project, this art project where we make a book entirely out of foraged ingredients mushrooms used to make paper, pigments, dyes, etc. Well, part of the process here, as you can see being demonstrated, is really trying to kind of get to know the fungus, get to know its properties. Um, so a lot of it is kind of investigative, even though in some sense <laughs> it's like we know it's, it's not going to work. We still learn about the properties of, of the fungus. So as is kind of a standard procedure with, with, with James and I, we, 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 get a, we get a fungus and we try initially to turn it into paper. So what you see here is just one way of making paper. So you've liquidized your fungi with some water um, to about the consistency of a kind of runny wallpaper paste and then you, you tip it in the frame. Um, let some water, well, kind of even it out a little bit using a bit of water to make that easier. Looks like chocolate, I wish it was. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's also quite glassy and because of the, the, the kind of gel-like nature of it, it really holds on to its water. So unlike some other fungi that we've made paper with, it, it, it this doesn't drain through so much, which actually caused a few problems. So, so yeah, we've got it in the frame. And we're thinking, what are we going to do? It's not draining. But, you know, the, the great thing about this project is there are no mistakes. We're just learning all the time. So what we tried here, because it didn't drain initially the first time, we've decided to add it to the, um, the mesh, but without um, kind of putting it in, in, in the water bath to help distribute it. Um, so this is just liquidized fungi, whole liquidized jelly ear. And we're going to put it in the dehydrator instead of drying it in the frame, see what happens. So I'll leave that for a minute. Then another, another thing that we're investigating is the potential for different fungi to be used for sizing paper. So that partly depends on their kind of glue-like sticky quality. So until I met James, <laughs> I actually thought sizing paper was getting a pair of scissors and cutting it to different sizes. Um, 
but yeah if you're an artist you'll know exactly what it means it, it means in some way incorporating a substance into the paper either when you're making it or by brushing it on afterwards um, that has the quality um, that will mean that once you've come to, to paint on it or write on it the pigments won't run so what we're doing here is investigating the glue like quality of, of jelly ear whole jelly ear just blitzed up so did it one way with a couple of cedar logs in here also glued um, just two bits of wood together and left it for 12 hours now I'm using all my strength here to try and pull it apart and it's looking pretty promising as a glue until it comes apart and the reason it has as you can see is it's not quite dry um, but one of the other reasons it, it might have not made as strong a glue as it potentially could have done is because of the, the, the bits that were still left in there but I'll, I'll come back to that so what we're doing here is we're making paper out of a fungus that we've successfully made some really good strong paper with um, called turkey tail so what we're doing we're chopping up the turkey tail which is quite tough quite yeah quite leathery so we're chopping that up and we're going to blitz that up probably I don't know let's say about half turkey tail and half pulped jelly ear. now the reason for doing that is to size paper with the, the, the gel of the jelly ear actually incorporated into the, the sheet rather than brushing it on so let's see what happens there now these actually need to be blitzed around for about two minutes in a high power liquidizer just because they are quite tough and leathery as I said so you, re you really need to break them up as much as you can now you might think why don't you powder them um, and then blitz them up well you could do that um, but if you did your paper wouldn't bind because doing it this way although it just looks like a kind of fine pulp um, there's actually thin kind of fibrous parts in there that will help bind and, and set a paper now the paper you saw there isn't actually paper made from that one it's from from birch polypore but the same principle applies now this time we're thinking well the glue didn't set because of all, all the little bits or um, you know maybe we could just extract the gel minus the rest of the body of, of the, the jelly ear fungus and, and see how that works in various ways so what we've done we've liquidized the jelly ear with some water and now we're just going to pass squeeze it through a very very fine cloth just to extract the gel and there you see it coming out a bit like wallpaper paste so I'll give it a few squeezes and there you see the residue left in the cloth and as is my way I'm thinking about throwing it at James and then <laughs> thinking better of it and tasting of it tasting it I um, should have just thrown it at James <laughs> I think part of the reason it didn't taste so great as though you can eat this fungi raw is because we were in, in large part selecting them as art materials we, we were getting some that, that weren't in the best of condition now this is one that we dried earlier which was the whole fungus not just the extracted gel and you can see it's a bit bitty it's a bit um, kind of brittle and when it dried on the sheet it actually kind of broke up um, as it dried now this time we're just pouring the extracted gel into the frame and below that frame is a non-stick sheet um, nothing else no mesh or anything it's just just to give it some shape so we lift up the frame carefully actually because it holds its water it doesn't actually run so that's that's pretty good so we're going to put that in the food dehydrator on a low heat for a few hours kind of see what happens essentially so where is it it's been blown around by by the fan and we have this amazing semi kind of translucent sheet which now has potential for drying and mixing with with paints as a binder um, 
or actually came up after this video was made. An amazing <laughs> recipe where I made a, a, a consomme soup with floating mushrooms that had, I cut this as sails. It was amazing. So I'm going to be working on that one as well. Um, so, so here's our uh, birch polypore paper. Now this is another way of sizing paper. You can just brush um, your sizing liquid on either side to kind of soak it in. So that's the alternative to actually incorporating it into the paper when you're making the paper. So I really soak it in well, really br brush it on. And then when it's thoroughly, thoroughly brushed and soaked in, you just need to set it aside until it's completely dry. And then it's ready for, you know, to, to apply paints, um, pigments, writing, inks, um, whatever you're going to do for your artwork. Just let it dry naturally. So here, my favorite jelly ear recipe. So pick ones that are dry or just pick them fresh and then dehydrate them. Then soak them in your favorite spirit. Now it could be um, sloe gin, um, something like this. This is actually Grand Manier. Then put them in a freezer for about six hours and then dip them in melted chocolate. Hang them on somewhere to dry until they don't have that um, kind of shiny appearance. And they are absolutely fantastic. Now here's um, some other pigments we were messing around with, with um, jelly ear gel and um, King Alfred's cake spores. So, as you can see, the, the Forage Book Project is coming on in leaps and bounds. And uh, <laughs> we're very happy with it. So I hope you'll continue to follow our project as we document our experiences with, with making this book. And hopefully you'll get involved as well.